I've got here on my sheet uh, intro uh, question mark. So I have no intro. We're going to jump right into uh, John <laughs> chapter 6. Um, the Gospel of John uh, introduces us to the ministry of Jesus Christ, uh, the Son of God. The Word became flesh. He did, we're introduced to his public ministry in chapter 1 of the book of John, and it's taking place in, in near the northern region of Israel. The northern region of Israel, it's, it was known as Galilee, and uh, Jesus shows up at a, at a northern section of the Jordan River where John the Baptist is baptizing. And uh, Jesus gathers the first of several disciples. He picks up uh, uh, perhaps the Apostle John, Andrew, Peter. Uh, he, he, he heads up and finds a guy named Nathaniel, uh, Philip. And uh, with this small band of disciples, maybe others, he goes uh, to a small village called Cana. And he performs his first sign, turns water into wine. This is all happening in the northern region up in Galilee. And then at some point shortly afterwards, he heads down to the southern region, which is known as Judah. And he attends a Passover feast in Jerusalem. And he performs a number of different signs, the most significant of which are his, or is his uh, first cleansing of the temple. While he's in Jerusalem, he has an important uh, conversation with a man named Nicodemus, you'll remember. And um, <clears throat> then he heads out into the Judean countryside for a bit and carries on a preaching and baptism ministry alongside John the Baptist for a little bit of time. John the Baptist at this point has moved down south some, and Jesus is out in the wilderness. Well, then Jesus decides to head back up north again to Galilee. On his way up, he goes through a, a, the middle region of Israel, which was called Samaria. He has a very fruitful ministry among the Samaritans, and then he heads on up to, to Galilee. He heals an official's son, and then he heads back down south. For another, So just north, south, north, south. He's, he's just traveling up and down the region. He goes back down south for another uh, feast. He heals a man at Bethesda. And we spent the last month talking about the conversation that flows from that healing at the pool of Bethesda in Jerusalem. Today we're going into chapter 6. We find that Jesus has moved north again. So he starts in the north. He goes south. He goes back up north. He comes back south. And now he's going back up north. He's in Galilee where he's going to perform the miraculous feeding of over 5,000 people. It's a very well-known uh, story, uh, probably partially because of the fact that it's the only miracle event that's recorded in all four Gospels. Interesting. Uh, it's the only miracle event that is recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So John sets the scene for us in verses 1 through 4. That's what John tends to do when he's, work, when he's, he's kind of going on to another section in his narrative. He kind of sets up the new scene. Let's look at it in John chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Read along with me in your own Bible, if you would. After this, that is to say, after this conversation about, that Jesus has been having with the religious leaders in Jerusalem about the healing at Bethesda, after this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. It's just another name for it. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the Feast of the Jews, was at hand. Okay, that's just all background. It's all context for the, the next scene. Uh, verse 1 tells us that Jesus goes away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Okay, the western side of the Sea of Galilee, if it's from your perspective, is going to be over here, right? The western side of the Sea of Galilee is kind of Jewish territory. The other side of the sea means that Jesus goes to the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. And he heads over there, and there's a large crowd that's following him. Verse 2, because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Uh, there are a lot of people who are taking note of Jesus' healing power, and there are cr crowds who are kind of trailing after him. And John is continuing to draw our attention to this notion of signs. He, he really wants us to keep our fingers on the pulse. Watch what happens with the signs of Jesus, the sign that he performs and uh, the changing of the water into the wine, the sign of the temple cleansing, uh, the healing at Bethesda. The crowds are following him because they saw the signs that he's doing on the sick. 
Um, we've seen before that John wants us to keep our eyes on this notion of signs because in chapter 20, he tells us, I recorded these signs for you so that you might believe and that by believing, you may have eternal life. So you have on the one hand, the need for the signs of Jesus to be appreciated. They, they can function for the purpose of fueling faith. Um, I mean, just look, for example, at the confrontation between Jesus and the religious leaders in chapter 5. Everything we just talked about is the result of these religious leaders not appreciating the significance of what Jesus is communicating through the healing of the man at Bethesda. They don't appreciate the miracles, and they fail to recognize Jesus because of that. So on the one hand, you've got this need for the signs to be appreciated. Uh, however, on the other hand, there's another theme related to the signs that John keeps bringing up as well. Think of Nicodemus or the, the crowds in Jerusalem at the end of chapter 2 or the when Jesus goes up into Galilee where he's going to heal the official son and he comes up into Galilee and, and it, the, 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 you have these people that love the fact that Jesus is a miraculous, miracle-working healer. They appreciate the miracles, but they're so miracle-focused that they also fail to recognize who Jesus really is. So the signs are supposed to be fueling faith, but there's a, bu there's a bunch of trouble that can happen around the signs. You can fail to recognize the signs and not recognize Jesus, or you can love the signs too much and fail to recognize Jesus. So they're, they're a complicated theme in John's gospel. He wants us to keep our eyes on this. Keep it on the radar because it's going to be important as we get into the rest of chapter 6. Uh, uh, th this, these people who are following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Verse 3, Jesus goes up uh, on the mountain, or perhaps more accurately into the hill country, and uh, he sat down there with his disciples. Uh, you learn in Mark's account of this passage that Jesus is going there in order to find a desolate place so that they can get some rest, they can pull away with the disciples. And then we have this interesting other little piece of info in verse 4. Now the Passover, the Feast of the Jews, was at hand. Just want you to know that. Uh, it's just some content. Like, when John throws stuff in there, he like, when an author in a narrative throws in a little piece of info like that, like, that seems random. Okay, just hold on to it. Because as, as we walk through this, it's, it's going to pop back up. And in particular, just so you can keep your eyes peeled for it, John's providing the backdrop for this whole discussion that Jesus is going to have uh, about the bread of life uh, later in this chapter. Um, and it's going to tie into the theme of Passover and, and the manna from heaven that the Israelites received after they uh, experienced the Passover and the exodus from uh, Egypt. So there's a tying of themes that's going to happen together here. And it's significant that Jesus is doing this feeding about the time of the Passover. Uh, it's a, it's a, a re-capitulation uh, uh, of what took place in the Exodus out in the wilderness. Okay, that's the scene. And Jesus creates a problem. Uh, it's the first thing that John tells us in verse 5 after he set the scene. Here's, here's what John says. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that uh, these people may eat? Jesus and the disciples are trying to get some rest. You know, you, you can just imagine, I was talking with Jed this morning. Um, it's just busy. It's just busy, 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 busy. And Jesus is like, let's get, let's get some rest. But the miracle-laden ministry of the Lord has people traveling around the Sea of Galilee uh, into the hill country in order to be with him. We're told in Mark's account that upon seeing the crowd, Jesus has compassion on the crowd and ends up teaching them the rest of the day. Uh, so no rest for the weary. John tells us that even as the crowd is approaching, Jesus sees that at some point there's going to be a need to feed these people. And so Jesus decides to create a problem in the life of the disciples by asking Philip where Jesus and the disciples are going to be able to buy food for all these people. And the reason I say that Jesus creates a problem is because um, he and the disciples, uh, up until this point, there's probably no indication that he and the disciples are the ones who are responsible for feeding this small city 
of people that are coming towards them. Up until that point, there's, there's no reason to think um, that this is their job. But then Jesus asked this question, and uh, <laughs> it suddenly puts a, a proposition. It indicates that we're responsible for this. Um, it's a ridiculous number of people. Completely unreasonable to think that Jesus and the Twelve uh, or however many he's got here at this point, could possibly provide for this crowd of uh, what we're told, 5,000 men. Uh, we also know that there's a boy around, because he provides some loaves and fish a little bit later. Uh, Matthew tells us uh, 5,000 men besides women and children. If you were to take roughly the ratio of men to women and children in this room, you're talking about roughly 20,000 people in this event. Um, as high as. 20,000 people, scholars say. Lots and lots of people here. And uh, there's some question as to why, why does he even mention 5,000 men? Why does he just say 20,000? And perhaps it has something to do with the, uh, the, the attempts to, to make Jesus king uh, at the end of this passage. Uh, we really don't know exactly why he mentions it. But it's a lot of people, and it's ridiculous to think that Jesus and the disciples are responsible to provide for this. So when the Lord asks the question, how are we to buy bread? It poses a huge problem for poor Philip um, and the rest of the disciples. John gives us some interesting narrative insight here in verse 6. Turns out that the question, the problem, is part of a, a larger plan that Jesus is already hatching in his mind. Look at verse 6. Uh, he said this to test him. Interesting. For he, he himself knew what he would do. Jesus knew what Jesus was going to do. So he asked the question. He knows it's a total problem. It's just a test. Um, Jesus does this sometimes. Remember, there's a Samaritan woman at some point, and, and Jesus says something like, how should I give the, how, why, would, why, why would we give to dogs food from the master's table? And, and she's like, but, but even the dogs, or why would we give, why would we give uh, blessings to basically the Samaritans that belong to the Jews. And she says, even the dogs will eat from under the master's table. And, and he's like really impressed with her. It's a test. He says, he asks these questions. He already knows what he has in mind. He's going to see what comes out of this person's mouth. Jesus has a plan here. He knows what he's going to do. He knows how he's going to feed these people. There's no mystery in his mind. The question is not rising from ignorance uh, or, or, or curiosity. Um, he's not trying to figure out what to do. He's not asking the question in order to get help from Philip. Jesus does not need any help. Philip needs help. And so Jesus creates a problem that's too big for Philip to handle. And it's obvious that it's too big for Philip to handle. He produces a situation in which Philip cannot possibly provide a solution. The question is a test to see if Philip properly recognizes himself and properly recognizes Jesus. What does it take to pass this test? What does it take to be successful with this kind of test? Uh, with this particular kind of test, success is not a matter of finding a solution to the problem. That's not how you succeed with this kind of test, when the Lord does this kind of thing in your life. Jesus is not expecting Philip to actually figure out how to successfully find a way to feed 5,000 plus people. Uh, Jesus does not intend for him to come up with a solution. Jesus is not testing Philip's problem-solving skills. Okay, that's not the kind of test that we're dealing with here. It's a different type of, of test, and success is measured differently with this test. Does Philip recognize the limits of Philip? There's a smallness issue that needs to be recognized. And does Philip recognize the unlimited saving power of Jesus? There's a bigness issue that needs to be uh, recognized. A smallness in himself and a business in Christ. A business? A bigness in Christ. <laughs> Last week I think I said relevant. No, I said, um, uh, what did I say? I want you to be vigilant. Diligent and vigilant. Vigilant, which sounds kind of like village idiot. Uh, there is a bigness in Christ that needs to be 
recognized. And the question that Jesus asks right here is preparing the soil of Philip's heart so that he can have proper perspective on himself, so he can have proper perspective on Christ. Jesus is creating a problem that will test Philip and prepare Philip so that when it's all said and done, Philip can experience a greater sense of his need for Jesus and a greater sense of the true greatness of the salvation of Jesus. And the tool that the Lord uses uh, for this, the tool that the Lord uses to accomplish and th- th- this 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 agenda that he has to cultivate faith in the wonderful salvation power of Christ, the tool that Jesus uses is a problem, a, a difficulty in Philip's life, a trial in Philip's life. You might even say suffering. Okay? It's fairly mild suffering, but, but um, the principle is there. Jesus is willing to create a problem for Philip in order to help Philip get where Philip needs to be in terms of understanding himself and understanding the bigness of Christ. Um, Perhaps you've tasted this kind of test before, uh, a test that's intended to help you see your need, a test that's intended to help you see the greatness of of Christ. Perhaps you're tasting this kind of uh, test right now. What is is Christ trying to teach me um, about myself, about my neediness, about my incapabilities, about my lack of control uh, over my life, uh, about my heart, what great things about God is, is he teaching us about himself through this, about his strength, and that, that actually might be hard to say, it might be hard, hard to know what God's going to teach you through this. Some trials you already made it through. You're already, you're already on the other side of the trial. You already saw Jesus feed the 5,000, so to speak. You're on the other side of the trial. You've already tasted uh, your smallness, but you've already tasted the greatness and the goodness of the Lord in relationship to that trial. But some, some trials uh, in this room, perhaps you are no further into the trial than Philip is into his trial right there, now at this point in the, in the narrative. Uh, you're still computing the question. Uh, say what? Did you just did you just say how are we gonna buy food for these people? Uh, you're 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 still kind of reeling from 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 the realization of, of, of what's going what's going on here, and there's no telling. There's really no telling what God's going to show you about yourself through this. There's really no telling from the perspective that you're at right now what God's going to show you about Himself through this, and that's okay. But part of part of what a, a trial needs some time is uh, time. Sometimes it needs time. The, the, the process ha- has to have its way with you. God has to have his way with you through the process, and it's okay. In other words, like you don't have to have answers right now. What is God teaching me about myself? What is God teaching me about himself? Uh, oh, time will, t- time will tell. This will, this will bear fruit. Uh, in time. Every providence is perfect and beautiful uh, in time. I want you to listen as Philip begins processing and realizing the impossibility, naturally speaking, of the task. He's just coming to terms with the situation in verse 7. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. A denarius is a day's wage. Okay, so 200 days worth of wages. So you're talking minus Sabbath and festivals. You're talking about eight months worth of labor, uh, which is going to be the equivalent of several tens of thousands of dollars. Just imagine if, if you had a fifty thousand dollar salary, you're talking about uh, three fourths of the year, three fourths of your salary, um, a lot of money. And in Philip's estimation, that would not be enough money. I'm thinking of Weston Alon, who just like fed people for a wedding feast. Right? Um, <laughs> how many people? Three hundred and thirty. Okay, twenty thousand. Three hundred thirty. Twenty thousand. <laughs> Okay, okay. So, it's a lot 
in, Philip, in Philip's estimation, that's not enough to buy even a little bit for each person. Um, so Jesus asked this question. Philip very quickly processes the problem, realizes it cannot be done, cannot afford this. I don't know what you're talking I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, there's another disciple, Andrew, Peter, Simon Peter's brother. He's listening in. Jesus' uh, question puts him basically in the same dilemma as Philip. I mean, how are we going to feed all these people? So the test applies to Andrew as well. He chimes in, and though he has a slightly different response, he comes to basically the same conclusion as Philip. Look at it in verses 8 and 9. Um, one of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but, but what are they for so many? Uh, it's like, okay, I got a pack of gum. And it's almost like the kind of thing that, like, after you say it, you're like, I should have just not even said it. <laughs> okay, his point is simply this. Nobody has any food, except for this boy. He's got, like, a few fish and some loaves. Okay, And that's not going to do jack. In other words, I, I, I don't think what we're seeing here is faith in Andrew. You know, sometimes it, you know, I think people think, well, Andrew shows a little bit of faith here. I don't think, I don't think so. Uh, I, Andrew uh, is not suggesting that Jesus do a miracle with the loaves and the fish. He's not suggesting this food can somehow contribute to the need. His conclusion is, what are they for so many? This boy's got some stuff. I mean, we're, 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 this is a hopeless situation. And that's what he's expressing, the hopelessness of resolving the situation. As far as he can tell, no answer to this. Which means that for both Philip and for Andrew, phase one of the test is passed successfully. And passed like that. I mean, immediately. They both realize the limits of their uh, abilities. And I think given this particular situation, most of us would come to the same conclusion. Because it, it, it's ridiculously Im impossible. So... For this part of the test, Jesus set them up for an easy success by giving them a situation that was just very clearly and obviously like an impossible thing to do. So they realized their smallness very quickly. Um, that's not always uh, something that happens quickly, though, is it? When you think of your own trials, um, sometimes it takes quite a while before you get to this point where you're, as we would say, you've come to the end of yourself. Uh, sometimes it doesn't happen. I mean, these guys process this in seconds, but it doesn't, it doesn't happen so quickly a lot of the time. Sometimes it takes a while to reach the point of realizing, okay, we're not in control of this. And try as, me, as we might, uh, we are not going to be able to overcome this obstacle. Uh, it... it, it it can be a very frustrating process to get to that point. Because for a while, you can, you can try. You're trying to resolve the problem, you're trying, and, and that, that path is cut off. And then you try to, like, this could be like a health issue, or it could be a money issue, or it could be, it could be a, a family issue, and you try this, and, and you try this, and, and you try, and you're just frustrated. This effort is frustrated, and this effort is frustrated. And, this, and it's a very frustrating process until you get to the point where you realize that, okay, I, I got nothing here. I cannot, I cannot do this. And if and when you get to the end of yourself, that can be, doesn't have to be, but that can be a very hopeless moment, meaning you feel no hope at that point. Because often, um, that's as far as we succeed in the test. We often stop right there. We feel small, but the problem persists, and we cannot conceive of any way to fix the problem, and yet the problem persists, and it's pressing in, but we can't do anything about it, and it's this, it's this dilemma, it's this cycle of, 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 of it, it's insane. You keep doing the same things, but you keep coming to the same results, and it's hopeless. You're hopelessly kind of festering in this uh, cycle of the dilemma, and it's just a cliff. It's just a hopeless cliff. You've come to the end of, of everything that you can see that can be done, and the problem remains. Because our eyes are, are, are fixed 
on the problem and the inability to remedy the problem, and then we transfix on the problem, and then we transfix on an attempt to get a remedy, but we got no remedy, and then we tra and your eyes are just right there. And, and it's really important. Really, you're only halfway through the test here. This is not enough. And if you stop right there, you will be miserable. You will be hopeless if, if that's as far as you get through the process. But it's not the only response available to us when we come to the end of ourselves. Coming to the end of yourself is often very exhausting. It's very frustrating, but it does not have to be hopeless. Coming to the end of yourself can be exhausting and frustrating, and it almost always is, um, and it can be very freeing to realize that I, I can't do this if you enter into the second phase of the test. That is to say, if in the realization of our inabilities, we stop hoping in our ability to eventually be able to fix the problem. And instead, you place that hope somewhere outside of the problem. Somewhere that is stable. Somewhere that is reliable. Somewhere that is powerful. And I'm talking, of course, about putting your hope in the Lord. <laughs> for me, my favorite passage of Scripture for navigating this type of, this type of issue uh, in moments in my life or even seasons in my life when I'm facing this type of thing is it's been Psalm 131. O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. Those are both ways in which David is saying, I, I, I'm not proud. My eyes are not lifted up, or my heart's not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. For I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O oh, Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. David has some pressing problems in his life. And he has come to the point of realizing that there are things that are too great for him. He comes to the end of my, uh, to the end of himself. I do not occupy myself with things too great or too marvelous for me. Can't handle it. Too much for me. He's come to the, to the end of himself, but, but notice that he doesn't keep trying to take control of things that are too much for me. I do not occupy myself with things too great or too marvelous for me. I'm not worrying about that. I, don't, I can't handle it. It's too much for me. It's too big for me, but I, because of that, I'm not going to try to keep fixing it. Figuring it out. I do not occupy myself with it. What would be the point? It's too great for me. So I'm not going to be proud and keep trying to do things that mere mortals cannot do. And instead of being consumed with the impossible task of trying to figure out how to resolve dilemmas that can only be resolved by God, I have calmed and quieted my heart like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. I, I sit quietly before the Lord the same way that a weaned child can sit calmly with its mother and not be in a crazed frenzy in an attempt to have its appetite quenched. In the midst of the circumstantial storm, my heart is at rest. Like a little, like a little child. Uh, you, 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 if you, if you, those of you who are mothers with ch children who are not weaned yet, um, it's very hard for a hungry child to sit into in the lap of a mother who is the mommy milk machine and to not go absolutely crazy trying to get food from mom. But a weaned child who's not depending on mom's milk any longer is able to sit calmly. And quietly and rest in the in the lap of his mother. David says, I, I had to learn how to do that. At some point, David passed through to the other side of this test. He not only felt small, too great for me, 
but he had grown confident that God was big. Big enough to manage the problem as he sees fit, which means I don't know how he's going to manage the problem. I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know when it's going to be. Um, but that's his deal. It's too much. I just cannot keep doing the insane thing of trying to control my life in ways that I cannot ever seem to have victory over. I can't do it. But God is big. And, and, he, and both of those things are there. I am small, God is big, and, and the result is that his heart's at rest. It's not an easy process to come to the end of yourself and to find rest in the Lord, holding fast to him, which is simply to say it is not an easy thing to learn how to hope in the Lord. We Again and again and again, we know that the Bible is calling us to put our hope in God, to have faith. It seems like a trite answer. I promise you it's not a trite answer. It is incredibly difficult to learn how to hope in the Lord because you have to be confident that, um, one, you can't do it. That hurts. That's hard. It's frustrating. It's exhausting. And two, you have to be confident that he really can sustain me in this. And that, that sometimes takes a trial to get you to that point where you really believe that. You really do. It is rarely, if ever, a painless process. <laughs> bummer, because Jesus will um, produce problems to accomplish this in our, in our lives. In the words of, of Sheldon, his name is Sheldon Van Acton, God, Jesus is willing to bring severe mercies into our lives. It is nevertheless a very valuable process, and a process through which God powerfully changes us and gives us great joy in the end as we learn how to take refuge, genuinely take refuge, and quiet our souls in him. So Philip and Andrew, where are they in this process? They're at the end of themselves. They can't provide a solution. They feel small. What will they do? Will they despair? Uh, keeping their focus on the problem, keeping their focus on their inabilities. Will they turn to Jesus and find their rest by hoping in him? And the answer is, we are not told. <laughs> uh, because John's not mainly telling the story about what happens in the hearts of disciples when they face ominous uncertainty. He gives us a little glimpse into that by just telling us that it's a test, but then he, he kind of leaves, he doesn't ever really answer that question once we, once, once Philip, and, we know that Philip and Andrew know that it's impossible, and right there, uh, he changes, he changes the story. We don't really get any more insight into their heart. Because the main point of the story is not what's happening in the hearts of Philip and Andrew. The main point of the story is Jesus and the fact that he has a definite plan to provide for the deepest needs of his people in the most desperate of circumstances. So all the focus turns from the test, everything we've just been talking about, to the plan and the saving power of Jesus. That's where the emphasis falls for the rest of the passage. And so look at this. Look at the, the plan and the saving power of Jesus in verses 10 to 13. Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves. And when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. Did Jesus bring some order to the gigantic crowd? I think in one of the uh, accounts of this, we're told that he seats them down in, in groups of 50s and 100s or something like that. And uh, he seats them in a plentiful apparently a grassy area that's surrounding them. He takes the very thing, thing that seemed as though it were a worthless contribution for solving the dilemma, the barley loaves and the fish. Barley loaves were the, the bread of the poor. It was, cheaper, it was cheaper to make. 
Um, so he takes the most unlikely of things here. He gives thanks to God for these seemingly worthless contributions and miraculously distributes enough food to the crowd so that everyone eats, in the words of verse 11, as much as they wanted. It's an all-you-can-eat. Uh, and once everybody is full, Jesus has the disciples gather up the leftovers, presumably to allow them to more fully experience the bounty, uh, hands-on experience of the bounty of Christ's provision here. It results in 12 baskets full of bread, which is crazy. I, I mean, there's more bread at the end than there was to, be, to begin with. There's more bread left over than there was to begin with. It's absolutely bountiful. It is a mind-blowing miracle. You would, uh, you'd be go like your jaw, your jaw, jaw would be dropped. You'd be absolutely, absolutely blown away if you saw this happening. You'd be freaking out. <laughs> like, what are you supposed to do with this? Who, who is this guy? What's going on here? You've got all these prophecies. You know, you're a religious person. You got all these prophecies. You're thinking back on, on, on who. On, on what's supposed to come when the Messiah comes, your mind's spinning. You cannot believe what you're seeing. What's the significance? Is the miracle supposed to teach us about how important it is to share your food with others, like the little boy who shared his lunch with Jesus? Is that the, is that the point of the story? Uh, the answer to that question is no. It's not the point of the story. Dis despite what the summer VBS curriculum taught all our kids, which we now need to debug. This, this is not morality tales, okay? Um, that's, not what G, that's not what the Bible's providing for us, moral lessons on how to share with people who have less. Okay, that's not what's going on here. That's not the lesson. If that's what you come away with, you miss the point, right? Uh, is this about how God will get you through your hard times? Well, that's relevant Revelant. That's relevant, uh, but that's not really penetrating beneath the surface of what's happening here. Uh, you see, we can learn some things in this passage about God testing us so that we can learn how to rest in Him in the midst of our trials. I mean, everything we just talked about. There are some things we can learn about that from this passage, but there's something more profound going on here. When Jesus turns uh, water into wine in chapter 2 of Mark's, or John's Gospel, he's not uh, just lending a helping hand by providing a better beverage and, because the bridegroom kind of forgot about it. Okay? The, the sign of the turning of the water into wine indicates something profound about the arrival of the Messianic age. When Jesus cleanses the temple in chapter 2, he's not just rearranging the furniture. You got to dig beneath the surface a little bit here. The sign indicates something profound about his identity as being in himself the new meeting place of God. When Jesus heals the disabled man at the pool of Bethesda in chapter 5, he's not the point of the story is not Jesus can give you physical health. The sign indicates something profound about the fact that Jesus has been sent by the Father and his works are the Father's testimony that this man is from God. And when Jesus feeds 5,000 plus people, he's not just teaching us that he can get us through hard times. The sign indicates something profound about God's salvation from the unresolvable problem of not physical hunger, but eternal death through the work of his son. This isn't the first time that God has provided bread in the wilderness for his people. Remember, Israel celebrates the Passover. They enter into the wilderness. God miraculously provides manna for the 12 tribes of Israel in the wilderness. And once again, God is providing abundantly for his people. Twelve baskets of left leftovers testify that this is a new work of God in the wilderness, providing the abundance for his, his people. The, the twelve probably is intentionally indicating that what God did with Israel, he is now doing with a new Israel that finds its identity in Christ himself. And the people of God are united to Christ. We are the new Israel. The providence of God in this miracle signifies not merely a matter of, of manna, and ultimately it signifies something more than barley loaves. 
This miracle is not merely a statement of Christ's ability to help us through hard times or how he can use unlikely means to uh, take care of us. The main significance of the miracle is to display that in Jesus, the Father is providing the true bread from heaven to nourish the deepest eternal needs and longings of the human soul. And that's what the rest of chapter 6 says is going to unpack for us. The sign of Jesus are packed with meaning beyond the miracle itself. So we're going to see the meaning of this miracle as we work through chapter 6. Okay, the crowds, really impressed with this miracle of Jesus, as we would be. And they knew that it indicated something profound about Jesus. It becomes clear, however, that they have a skewed understanding of what it means about Jesus, Uh, Their response is in verses 14 and 15. When the people saw the sign, there it is. John just keeps our eyes on that. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. And verse 15 goes on to say, they were about to come and take him by force to make him king to the throne as the king of Israel. They associate the sign with a promise uh, from Deuteronomy 18. Uh, And this is what Deuteronomy 18, 15 says. It says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. This is Moses speaking. From among you, from your brothers. It's going to be an Israelite. A prophet. It is to him you shall listen. And in verse 18 of Deuteronomy, it says... uh, Deuteronomy 18. I will raise up for them, the Lord says to Moses, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. This was widely recognized as uh, one of the many prophecies uh, of the coming Messiah, coming King of Israel, who who would speak God's words to Israel. And the crowd believes that this sign of the feeding of the 5,000 plus indicates that Jesus is this prophet that was foretold by Moses. That is to say, they believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They believe that Jesus is the king of, of Israel. And they're right about that. But what they don't understand is the nature of his kingship. Because Jesus himself says when he's on trial, says to Pilate, Pilate says, are you king? Are you the king of the Jews? And uh, Jesus answers, my kingdom's not of this world. But of course, the crowds, they have no idea that this is the case. They see the miracle. They associate Jesus with messianic promises. And they do what any of us would have done and what we would expect anybody else to do. They prepare to enthrone Jesus as Israel's political and nationalistic king. But Jesus sees it coming and he heads to the mountains by himself. Uh, to be by himself. He he takes off before before it can materialize. Verse 15, perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king. That's probably why you've got the mention of the 5,000 men. uh, By taking him by force and uh, ensuring that he is recognized as the king of Israel. Um, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Because the salvation that he will bring will not be secured through political or military triumph. Um, He most definitely intends to bring salvation to Israel, but he's going to save his people in a way that corresponds to the feeding of 5,000 men plus women and children with five barley loaves and two small fish. Which is to say, Jesus is going to, in the most unlikely way, take what appears to be of no value, and through his cross, he will provide eternal salvation for his people. Of all the unsurmountable, insurmountable dilemmas that we have, or ever will face, the problem of sin and judgment that Jesus resolved for us at Calvary will forever be the the finest moment of his uh, saving work his provision for us in our dilemmas. And I, I want to encourage us uh, to make this a, a, a priority of your life. 
right at the very top of all things that you prioritize, I want to encourage you to prioritize anchoring uh, all hope in the resolving of that great dilemma. And let your mind linger. Learn how to linger over the work of Christ at Calvary so that your heart can taste what it's like to rest in the victory of Jesus over the ultimate trial, the, 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 the dilemma of, in the words of Jonathan Edwards, sinners in the hands of an angry God. Let your mind linger over the fact that Jesus resolved that uh, dilemma. The, the most absolutely impossible thing for us to resolve is how are we going to get rid of this sin problem? How are we going to be right with God? How are we going to undo the, the, the issue? I mean, the, the, the judgment of God against sinful humanity is fierce. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is that day, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. I will bring distress on mankind so that they shall walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to deliver them on the day of the wrath of the Lord. In the fire of his jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed for a full and sudden end he will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. Thus says the prophet Zephaniah, and it is the reality of what sin deserves. And Jesus resolved it for you. He took it away. He, he took that away. Let your mind linger over the salvation of God. And may God be pleased to use that supreme triumph as fuel to help us face the multitude of difficulties that we will encounter in our lives. And we will. We will, we will face them again and again and again. And may we have then the weaponry, if we linger over the gospel, to face the most ominous of trials, knowing that they can't possibly pose a threat to the kind purposes of God. Jesus has foreseen it with the same foresight that he saw right here. He has a plan, and, and, and even though it may seem as though there is no solution, his soul-satisfying agenda is underway. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Amen.